good morning, good morning, fellow traders, and um, happy new year. Um, welcome to today's live trading session. As you guys know, today is Monday, January 8th, 2024. It's a new year, and um, now it's time for us to focus in, hone in, and um, try to identify some high probability setups for this year. And of course, for this year, I do have some goals as far as my trading goals. I, I actually want to do um, a bit better, even though last year I did do decent. I did OK. But, um, you know, I tweaked some things over the holiday break. And um, now I think I have something that uh, may work quite well for 2024. But who knows? Because the market tends to change at any moment. What worked before may not work as well in the future. But what we're going to do is stick to a plan, use proper money management and risk management and be better at um, execution or, or have better discipline when it comes to the market. So anyways, with that said, I hope all is well with you guys. I hope you guys started the trading year well, if you already started. But um, now it's time for us to storm out the gates full steam ahead and let's see what the market gives us for 2024. So with that said, what we're going to do is look at a few momentum plays. And um, I can be honest for this morning, I don't really see too much going on in all honesty for this morning. But, you know, I do have a few pairs I want to look at and um, and then we can go from there. But, you know, for the most part, there's not really too much going on. But um, it doesn't mean that we can't look at the charts and try to identify certain things technically. So with that said, what we're going to look at right now is the Aussie USD. We're currently looking at the four hour chart. I usually start at the one hour, but today I want to start at the four hour. And what we can clearly see from this particular chart is that, you know, we're obviously bearish on this chart. Price is making lower lows, lower highs, lower lows. And um, it made this correction, which is still a lower high. Now it's in the middle of this impulse, right? So you can say that we're bearish on Aussie USD on the four hour. And I believe we're also bearish on the one hour as well. You look at the one hour, um, price was bullish, but price, you know, rotated or pushed to the downside. And we're in a bearish environment on a one hour as well. So Based on that, we should be looking for opportunities to sell. Um, both environments are bearish, four hours bearish, one hour is bearish. Um, you know, it'll be wise to look for a short or a sell. However, if you look to the left, we see that we have this candle right here with this nice long wick to the downside. So we see this candle, and um, what it tells us is that there's strong buying, if not somewhere in the middle of this candle, at least around this origin, you know, right around here where the low is um, of this candle. So then one thing we do know is that there's possibly strong demand um, in this particular area, and we may have to be somewhat careful with a, with a short or with a sell. It doesn't mean that we can't execute a sell. We have to be somewhat careful of it. But um, of course, price could very well go down and retest this area just to come back up again. That's a possibility. But if you're more of the conservative trader, you will probably wait for it to clear this entire zone right here first before you decide to execute a short. That's if you want to be more conservative, more risk averse. You'll look for price to clear this area first, then wait for the pullback, then enter your short. You'll wait for something like that. But um, yeah, right now we are in a bearish environment on the four hour and the one hour. But um, let me go back up to the four hour to see if this is an area of demand. And uh, we do see that. We do see that price is testing an area of demand. We have this long wick here, but you can see here that we had an impulse, a break to the upside. This function like demand historically. And then we have all this imbalance right here. Um, this imbalance. So then that could be the reason why uh, why we're seeing uh, what we're seeing right now. So then let me just do this. I'm just going to do a few things. I'm just going to draw this right here for this area right here. Just say this is our area of imbalance where we saw strong buying come in. So then, you know, um, we could 
sort of understand why price may have wicked from this level, but we also have four hour demand. So then this is an area where there's a lot of buying pressure um, around this entire zone. So then, you know, whenever you do see something like this, you have to be um, somewhat careful, be um, cautious and just know that if you do enter a short, there's a possibility that price may um, turn against you if you do um, sell. So yeah, now for me, for all the USD, I think I'm going to wait a little bit. I need to see more um, on the Aussie USD. Um, so I'm just going to maybe take my time on this and not be so quick to assume anything. But if you do decide to enter or, or you want to short this trade, then you'll just simply wait for price to pull back to an area of, of supply and then, you know, look for an opportunity to enter a short. But um, for me, I'm just going to sit out for a little bit just to really figure out what price wants to do. Um, you know, I may not even trade any U.S. dollar based pairs or denominated pairs for today. Um, it all depends on what the market gives me. But for now, um, I want to be a little bit more cautious, use a bit more discipline in 2024 and not assume anything. Just wait for price to give you a clear path towards a target. And if you do that, you'll be better off in the end, um, in all honesty. So um, I may just sit this one out and not um, execute anything yet um, until I see, have more certainty and clarity on what price wants to do. But this is the Aussie USD. Aussie USD. We're obviously in a bearish environment and um, price can very well push down and plow through these lows. So we'll see. But I'm going to stay out. All right. So, yeah, I don't know if Marvin had anything that he wanted to share. Did you want to share anything about this particular setup or no? Well, yeah, I can just kind of briefly mention how like really for today, like on this Monday in particular, like really most of our instruments, most of our asset classes are really at the mercy of the U.S. dollar. Um, the U.S. dollar primarily, like if you look at the Dixie or if you look at the U.S. dollar equally rated index, and also even if you look at what U.S. Treasury yields are doing, you can see that they're kind of flat for the session. Like everything is flat, even when it comes to U.S. futures markets in the equity space, like everything is pretty flat and neutral. But of course, just like Nevin pointed for the Aussie, we can see that the Aussie is selling off. But if you look across on really your commodity linked currencies like the Aussie, the Kiwi and Canadian dollar, they're all selling off today. And there's a reason for it. There's sell off in the commodity sector. We see gold, we see gold tumbling lower, oil really tanking lower, lower on some OPEC updates and some news coming out of um, Saudi Arabia. But, you know, it seems like for today and just like I mentioned, even and I think I, I kind of mentioned it in the description on yesterday, how Mondays are traditionally a low liquidity day, a low volume day. And it seems as if um, investors are still in that mode of trying to figure out how they're going to reallocate some of their um, securities and some um, instruments they have in their portfolio. They're still trying to figure out how they want to posture themselves for the upcoming year. So then we're still in this sort of low liquidity environment. And I think things will pick up, especially um, after we see the um, earnings uh, earnings season, um, this next earnings season kick off on Friday morning. But um, yeah, it's a pretty you know neutral day, slow day. But um, yeah. as of Aussie USD, for me, my personal bias is I'm hoping to see more downside or more weakness in the Aussie USD. Yeah, but, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Most likely with what I'm looking at, I think we may see that, but you never know. You never know. So, um, yeah, but yeah, this is the Aussie USD. And uh, what I want to do right now is go to a particular pair where uh, we may see an opportunity, even though this one is quite risky as well, but um, it's the Euro Aussie D. Uh, let's go there right quick. Euro. Ooh, well, Euro. Aussie, uh, Euro Aussie, E U R A U D. All right. So, um, you know, this one is quite similar, but, you know, we can see here that we're in this bullish environment on a one hour. Uh, we have also a um, bullish environment, obvious bullish environment on the four hour. So, of course, this is a trade where we do have momentum on our side. And we can look for a buy if price dips or pulls back to an area of demand. And um, for this one, I want to take this a little bit further because right here on the 15 minute chart, 
Uh, we can clearly see that uh, we do have um, an area of 15 minute demand here. And what I may consider, I, I don't know yet if I am I'm going to consider it this, but um, I may do this. I may look for a buy somewhere around this zone. But even with this trade, we have to be somewhat cautious because, like I mentioned, you know, with this candle right here, with this long wick right here, this long wick candle uh, right around there, there's a reason for price to maintain that selling price action. So, you know, we have this long wick candle right here. That's from the last Friday's non farms. Yeah, yeah, this is from the non farms. Um, so then, of course, you know, what you could do is wait for price to break and clear this level to know for certain what's going to happen. But um, there's a possibility we could actually see price break through that area as well. But if you go to the four hour chart, we can see that we are approaching an area of four hour supply somewhere right around here. And uh, let me do this uh, right now. So then um, let me just from here, I'm just going to do it from here all the way to here. Um, you know, we can see price um, tag this area um, and even. Um, do a little bit more actually, but yeah, this area right here is an area of of supply for our supply. So, you know, we should be expecting a rotation soon. But going back to the one hour or the fifteen minute time frame, we do have a good opportunity for a pullback buy. Um, however, we have to be careful because we are at this wick area right here. But um, you know, we'll see what happens. But for the most part, if I was to take this from a 15 minute time perspective, I'll be looking for a buy at this area of demand right here. So then let me just draw this in um, on a 15 minute and area of demand is right here. And let me label this as 15 minute demand. So we're gonna label this as 15 minute um, demand in this particular zone. And uh, let me see how things look on the one hour. OK, so on the one hour chart, we do see demand in this area right here. But um, we also have this imbalance right here as well. Let me just draw this in. Uh, we do have this um, imbalance area, you could say right here, um, right around here. I'm just going to make this um, blue for now. Uh, we do have this imbalance area. So, yeah. Um, there's quite a few things or quite a few ways we can look at this. But for the most part, uh, what I would do is simply wait for price to come to me. I'm not going to do anything but wait for price to come to me. So if price decides to retrace down into this zone right here, then what I'll do is look for a buy opportunity and uh, at least test the highs. If not, you know, sh if, if not, uh, shoot above the highs, at least test the highs. So then, you know, right around here um, at these highs is where I would expect price to go. So if that is the case, um, but let me do this right quick. Let me uh, do this. And um, what I'm going to do is also place a buy order. Um, so let me do this. This is on a 15 minute, guys. I know usually we'll be targeting the. Um, you know, the one hour for a lot of these momentum setups, but I decided to do the two hour for today. But um, right around here is where I would probably look for my for my entry. Uh, right around here um, somewhere. So um, that'll give me like a 14 pip stop and um, a, a high right around here at 1.6380. So let's just... 1.6380, which is an institutional area. And then uh, our stop is right around 1.6342. Um, if you wanted to, you can do something like a whole number, like 40, if you want, 1.6340. But um, I think this should be um, good enough um, if we do decide to enter this buy on, um, on Euro Aussie. So then this is a good setup right here. Um, Decent, even though we do have supply to the left. Um, but you know, if you do want to get involved in the setup, then this is the um setup to get involved in. No, this is on a 15 minute, it's a 15 minute um pullback and correction um 
into this zone right here. So if you wanted to, you can place a pending buy limit at 1.63562, um, somewhere around there, uh, 1.63. 562 or 1.63564, uh, you know, whatever you want to do. And um, yeah, just go from there. Um, so yeah, I think for me, we could do 565. Um, but yeah, I'm fine with 562. So yeah, let's just keep it there. But yeah, yeah, like if you want to, you can place a pending buy limit uh, right at this area. Make sure you use good man risk management. And um, and then we'll just target the highs up here. So then um, that's the Euro Aussie on the 15 um, minute chart. And um, let me place an alert here, right around here. Uh, let me just do that. Um, add an alert when it gets into the zone and area. And it's a price testing 15 minute demand. If you bullish, look to buy. So, all right. Yeah, and if you want to, you can place a pending buy limit, which is um, what I may consider doing right now. I'm, I may consider doing that. So let me um, do a few things right quick. Let me, oops, no, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I don't have that set up right now. But um yeah, I would have to um set that up. But yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to, you can set this up with a 14 pip stop um uh, right at this particular area right here. So yeah. Yeah, are there any questions about um this particular setup? Going once, going twice. Okay, so um, yeah, I don't think I have um anything else. Um, I think that's probably it for me. I mean, of course, there's other opportunities like EuroCAD, Euro Kiwi. Um, those appear to be good ideas as well. But um, I think for now, I may just keep it um keep it simple. Um, for now, um, keep things somewhat simple. And um, just leave it at this. Just wait for price to come down into the zone, and then we'll enter a potential buy on um, on bullish confirmation, or just enter a pending buy order using small risk. So it's up to you what you want to do. As a matter of fact, let me just do this right quick because um, I know I don't have this on right now. Let me turn on the paper trading so we can use the position size tool. And uh, we can just do here, create limit order. And this will be our parameters right here. Our parameters will be what you would see right here. So um, yeah, and then you can adjust your risk, whatever you want to risk, 200,000, whatever you want to risk, you, you can adjust it right here and it'll tell you what your position size is, you know, right around here. So um, yeah, let me just um, do a little bit of that right now before, I move uh, forward. Let me just do um, that for now. And let's see how this goes. So yeah, looking to buy. So yeah, we'll we'll see what happens. But um, but yeah. All right. So if there aren't any questions, then um, I guess we can move on. And um, I may just look at one other pair and then um and then we can switch and move to the fundamental stuff, um, you know, the market analysis stuff. You guys know. But, um, yeah. Um, let me make sure I add this these parameters properly.
Okay. Yeah, I apologize, guys. I'm um, trying to do something else here. But yeah, so, yep. So yeah, did you have anything you wanted to say, Marvin? <clears throat> well, you know, well, I can just sort of say how the euro, you know, is just one of the more firmer currencies. Uh, what we're seeing across the currency spectrum is, you know, a lot of the funding currencies like, um, well, you can say the, the U.S. dollar, but really it's the euro, um, even the Japanese yen. They're, they're two of the stronger currencies for the session. And some would even say that the Japanese yen is benefiting from the fact that, um, well, for one, there could be a little bit of risk aversion in the market. Uh, one thing we do know is that, you know, funding currencies are sort of being supported while commodity-based currencies are sort of weakening. But um, yeah, with this particular setup, it's pretty much in line with what we see happening uh, for this session thus far. Now, today is Monday. It's it's a pretty, how can I say, uh, it's not a really clear day as far as, you know, where sentiment is going to lie and where markets going to move following the Wall Street open. Um, it seems as if right now markets are sort of waiting for a catalyst to to sort of help determine which way it wants to move, because there's really not any macro event today on the docket. Um, it's pretty fairly empty. Of course, there's New York um, consumer inflation expectations coming out in a few hours. And then I know we have a Fed member um, set to speak later. That's uh, Rafael Bostic. But apart from that, there's really not much that should drive asset prices or provide some level of conviction. So then we rely, when in cases like this, we rely primarily on what the technicals tell us. And in this case, uh, this will be a good setup since we already see the euro gaining strength on some good fundamental data from earlier this morning in the European session. And, um, you know, the Australian dollar is weakening due to that sell off in the commodity sector. So then um, that should help support and underpin this particular currency cross. But yeah. um, but we are approaching. <clears throat> yeah, we're at resistance. resistance. Yeah. So then anything can happen. Yeah. Really. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's kind of, you know. Like we do recognize that resistance, but we got to keep in mind that that was the resistance formed during the non-farms, the U.S. labor market announcement. Mm -hmm. And we saw uh, what happened. And so I may touch on that a little bit, um, even if we move to the uh, fundamental analysis part, uh, what happened on Friday. Because yeah. there's a lot of volatility on Friday, a lot of whipsaw on Friday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, what I wanted to say is <clears throat> I think you'll pretty much see the same thing for pairs like Euro CAD, Euro Kiwi. Um, you know, it'll be the same type of play where you'll look for opportunities to buy, you know, on those, um, you know, they're, they're similar. Um, but this one is more like in a consolidation mode right now. Let's, let's go to the one hour. See how the one hour is looking. Yeah, this is the one hour. You can see all this indecision at the highs. We may get a deeper correction. So, um, yeah, I would probably sit out on this one. But uh, we this is the Euro CAD and we also have the Euro um, Kiwi as well. I think that's um, looking somewhat similar to um, Euro Aussie. <clears throat> we do have this resistance, this structure right here. Look left, structure leaves clues. Uh, let me delete this. And we keep this here. But yeah, we can expect a pullback um, some, somewhere. And um, on the 15 minute, um, you know, it's somewhat... So somewhat similar, you know, right around this zone, we'll be looking to buy, but um, there's a possibility that price may retrace deeper, give us a deeper retracement, um, maybe down to this area, who knows? But, um, you know, right now we're looking at Euro Aussie. We have an alert set and I have a small pending buy, you know, right around here at buy limit. So yeah, we'll see what happens. <clears throat> so, um, all right. So with that said, I guess what we can do is switch and move on because I don't see anything else going on uh, right now. Um, well, let me just um, show you guys the dollar, the U.S. dollar and what I'm expecting to do or what I'm waiting for on the dollar, because uh, I think that'll be beneficial for you. But let me go to the equally weighted index and um, on the equally weighted index um, right here, we can see that the dollar is pretty much in consolidation. So then. I don't want really want to get involved in the dollar until it either breaks this high right here where this pink line is, which is this 15 minute 
zone of supply. If it breaks this high to the upside, that's when I'll get involved. In other words, break, pull back, and push into this larger time frame zone of supply. Or I would need to see price clear this zone of demand right here, then what look for a pullback and then then a sell off in the dollar. So I'm in this indecision phase right now. So I don't have a bias right now for the dollar. I'll rather wait for either of those two things to happen. And that's the reason why I'm sort of hesitant on the Aussie USD, um, because I'm waiting for this type of price action or these two type of scenarios to happen on both, um, well, on a US dollar index, uh, a break of the supply to the upside, 15 minute supply, or a break of demand <clears throat> on the one hour to create a bearish environment on the one hour. But um, yeah, we'll see. So then right now I'm just sitting on my hands, not gonna do anything. And that's what trading is all about. It's all about having patience and just sitting on your hands and waiting for the good setups to take place. You know, you have to take a sniper's approach. You know, a sniper doesn't pull the trigger at any and every everything. He's very selective, calculated, and focused on the right target. And he's precise. He uses precision. So then, you know, I don't want to do anything until I see either of these two things happen on a U.S. dollar. And then that's when I'll be more comfortable trading a U.S. dollar based or U.S. dollar denominated um, asset. But yeah, that's it uh, for me. That's all I wanted to share. But in the meanwhile, um, what I'm going to do right now is pass the mic over to Marvin, and he's going to talk about a few things fundamentally and, you know, what we have to look forward to. So, all right. <clears throat> yeah, and I may make this quick because I know uh, we may meet in the private war room or we're hoping uh, we'll be able to meet in the private war room and do a session there so that we can discuss, you know, some of this stuff later on. But uh, just like, you know, I mentioned before, uh, really last week really introduced a lot of uncertainty, especially on last Friday with the U.S. labor market data. Now, let's just um, pull that up real quickly. Let me just um, do this real quickly. Um, let me see if I can. Like um, pull up. Um, Okay, trying to um, pull up a browser so we could um, look at the labor data. And uh, what I'm going to do, you know what, I'm just going to go to um, Daily FX. Go to Daily FX, their economic docket, so that we can just look through the data, parse through the data on Friday, and we can sort of see what happened. But uh, let me just pull this up real quick. Um, this was last Friday right here so then uh, we got that and then um let me just um, pull in up finviz too so we can just take a brief look at the heat map right now the futures heat map just so we can get a broader overview of what's happening across financial markets and it seems as if right now uh, we see the markets are fairly mixed across the board but what we can really see on this heat map if you study it you can see that the commodity sector is really getting hit and selling off we see crude oil right here both brent and wti crude oil selling off and uh we see you know some of our soft commodities but even some of our base metals hard metals precious metals are even selling off like gold silver platinum so could this mean that the market in general is, is like because we see commodities selling off could this simply mean that the um market is sort of expecting um how can i say a pricing out of some of those rate cut expectations and rate cut odds that many analysts had priced in um even you know before the new year um you remember how the fed you know, when they had that last central bank meeting, they said that they were only going to do three, maybe rate cuts in uh, 2024. But the market, uh, which is, you know, your investors, your analysts, you know, they don't believe the Fed. They're, they believe that based on the way conditions are now, we should expect a, up to like five or six rate cuts. But um, if you think about the type of year we're in, 2024, and what's, un what's unique about this year, this is an election year. So then, 
in reality, does it make sense for the Fed to cut interest rates by six times, six or seven times in an election year? When, of course, they they build themselves on this reputation of not intervening in the market before uh, voting season because they don't want anything they do to sort of influence votes like how they um, adjust monetary policy, whether they cut rates or hike rates that can have an impact on stock markets and it can have an impact on people's feelings about the economy. So they don't want to intervene in the democratic process. So then usually they don't really make huge monetary policy adjustments, you know, um, during a presidential year or during an election year. Um, well, especially like two to three months ahead of voting season. So then in some way you can price out a lot of those rate cut uh, odds. And that's sort of what we're seeing happening now. And that's the reason why we see a lot of the uncertainty and just the imbalance, because, you know, it seems as if right now, does the Fed have a reason to cut rates and will they actually do it? And that's why I feel like we're seeing this sell off in the commodity space, but it, there's also a supply demand issue because we know that oil also moves off of, you know, news, you know, dealing with supply and demand. And we know that I think there are some discussions um, in Saudi Arabia. Let me just pull this up real quick. Um, then we talk to oil um, news. Let's see what comes up. See, Saudi. Arabia cuts February crude price <clears throat> to Asia. Okay, oil slides as Saudi price cuts counter Middle East worries. So then, of course, Saudi Arabia intervened to go ahead and cut oil prices to sort of help slow down any potential rally in oil due to what we see happening in the, uh, you know, um, what you call it? Why am I going um, blank? The guys, you, well, the, you know, that canal, you know, with the Red Sea, um, the Suez Canal, like, you know, since there's, you know, still tensions going on with oil uh, in the Suez Canal and the potential of war in that area, Saudi Arabia just moved forward to say, inst you know, instead of us seeing a spike due to geopolitical concerns, let's intervene and cut, you know, um, try to, you know, cut oil prices by raising up and boosting sort of like oil oil supply. So then, yeah, so then this news is coming out. Saudi Arabia cuts oil prices for February. They're actually intentionally cutting oil prices. So this is why we see oil sliding. But also on top of that, we know that there's this uncertainty over interest rates, over the Fed funds rate, and that is also contributing to some of the sell-off and risk aversion or, you know, that, that we see across the commodity space. But but yeah, as you can see, uh, most of the commodity sector is in red, but you can see the indices, our equity equity future indices are somewhat flat with the exception of the Dow. I know right now there's a little bit of clarity coming in. We're seeing a little bit of bounce in the NASDAQ and the S&P 500, which is interesting, but we still see the Dow and the Russell, Dr. Russell, sort of neutral, sort of flat. And we typically look at Dr. Russell because it's, it's really a more of a clear reflection of true hardcore like U.S. economics. Um, simply because there's not as much international exposure with the Russell. Um, the Russell is primarily filled with small to mid caps, you know, businesses, companies. And we, you got to keep in mind that most of America's growth or a lot of our growth and, you know, is, do is domestic. And it really comes from your small businesses. Our small businesses is what does most of the hiring, small to mid sized companies. So then the Russell is typically a reflection of just pure U.S. fundamentals without the international exposure. And as you can see, it's sort of flat. The futures, Russell, is sort of flat at break even. So then that's pretty much where you can rely on that as far as to just to see, you know, where conviction lies, that there is uncertainty. We don't quite know where assets going to move. And um, with the uncertainty, we, you know, which is interesting, we see the VIX, you know, selling off or you know lower which means that there's not as much uncertainty and this can be the reason why we're seeing a pickup in the the nasdaq and s p but sometimes there's a decoupling of these correlations and, and they don't quite make sense but what we do see we see the dax futures higher we see euro stocks futures slightly higher and we could see these indices or these futures markets move higher 
as we get closer to the Wall Street opening bell. But um, even on the Forex side right here, um, we can look at the Forex heat map and you see that the Japanese yen is clearly leading the way for the session, followed by the euro and the Swiss franc. Um, the Swiss franc, I think they, we had some retail sales numbers come out of, of the Swiss um, Swiss economy and I think some inflation numbers as well. Their CPI came out and it came out pretty good. Um, you know, you know it, it was a decent reading. So I think that's the reason why we're seeing this demand for the Swissy or the Swiss franc. But as you can see right here, all our commodity linked currencies are the weakest for the session. So then what happened on Friday? What happened on Friday? So then let's go to this right here. This is our calendar from Friday. And if we move down to the US docket, we could see exactly what happened during the employment release. Uh, we did have Canadian employment numbers uh, released at the same time, but um, we wanna focus on what happened with the US numbers, cause that's where all the eyes were focused on. And as you can see, we had this wonderful headline number. Um, all of the top line data showed or it would appear as if the U.S. economy, the U.S. labor market is doing fairly well. We see 216,000 jobs added in December uh, when the forecast was for 170,000 jobs. Uh, we saw unemployment tick lower and also we saw a pickup in average wage growth. We see wage growth um, yearly, year over year wage growth at 4.1% on, on a month to month. It also beat estimates um, improved by 0.4%. So on the surface, it looked pretty um, solid and pretty firm. And that's the reason why once this these numbers came out, we saw the dollars rally to the upside. Uh, we saw U.S. Treasury yield spike to the upside because it's kind of like, well, if the U.S. labor market is still tight and firm, then, you know, that can be a problem or that can be counterproductive to the Fed's mandate to maintain and bring inflation down. Because with a strong labor market, the more people you have working, um, the more individuals you will have spending money at their retailers and having discretionary income to spend money. And that would actually stoke the flames of inflation. So then the whole point of the Fed and what they're doing now, they want to cool inflation. So they have to make sure they dampen and cool the labor market. But um, if we look at our participation rate right here, you can see that the participation rate fell from 62.8 to 62.5. And if you look at most of the labor growth was really in government payrolls. It wasn't really in private payrolls, like your regular, you know, businesses, you know, on, you know, what, you know, it's like most of the, the growth or a lot, a good portion of it was government jobs <clears throat> that was added. So then when you factor that in, you know, this, Unemployment rate could, you know, I guess it can throw people off simply because the, um, the participation rate fell, which means that there's less people accounted for in the labor force. And there's not as many, I guess, people looking for work. And they use those numbers, the amount of people that are in the labor force to determine what the unemployment rate would be. So then this number could be skewed. So then this labor report wasn't really as great when you kind of put everything in perspective. But um, even if you go down and we look at the ISM services PMI, we see that the ISM services PMI actually fell lower. But if you look at the employment sub, sub index, look at this employment sub index. It dropped from 50.7% on last month to now 43.3% deep in contraction territory. This is the deepest pullback and drop in ISM services sector employment in over three and a half years. So then this is a troubling sign. So then with what we see with this softening in the labor force or in, in employment data, is there how can a solid a solid reason for the Fed or for the market to expect the Fed to cut rates by six, you know, cut rates six times? Um, in 2024. And, and what we see right now is a pricing out of those rate cuts. And, um, you know, that's what's creating some of the uncertainty, but we're also seeing some rebalance being factored into to price. But um, this is the non farms report and from um, last Friday. And um, right now for this week, there's not really much on the docket, especially for today. Um, today is a pretty light docket. Um, 
you know, low tier data. We don't really have much. We have consumer inflation expectations, but that's just the New York Fed's estimate. And then we have Fed, um, Atlanta Fed, Rafael Bostic speaking, and we may want to follow him simply because he is a voting member this year when it comes to monetary policy. So what he feels, what he thinks um, will have some level of impact simply because he's one of the Fed presidents that vote. You remember, they rotate the voting privileges um, every year. So then he's a voting member this year. So then uh, what he believes or what he thinks may have an impact on what the Fed may do. So then he'll be speaking in roughly three and a half hours or, or three hours and 40 minutes. But um, we don't really have much on the docket until later on in the Asian session. We have Australia retail sales, Australian building permits. And that's pretty much it. I think the market's sort of going to be in a choppy mode and in balance until we do see the U.S. inflation data come out on Thursday. So we could see some back and forth, some oscillation. Uh, we may see uh, volume and volatility really pick up um, later on in the week following the U.S. inflation data. But most importantly, even when we do see the official kickoff of this year's earnings season. So then let me. Well, not, well, I just, you know, I won't put it up. Um, I think, um, yeah, I posted it. Let me see here in the calendar right here. Let me just move this down. You can see right here that um, this is the earnings docket for this week and like all of these companies that are reporting ahead of friday this is still november's earnings season or this is the earnings season from last last quarter but um we, this the this year's earnings season starts on friday in the pre-market and it will be kicked off with jp morgan chase um you know before like years ago um alcoa used to be the one that we would look at to sort of kick off earnings season but um you know, right now that's changed since they've been sort of um, downgraded. Their level of importance has been downgraded. And even with Intel, Intel used to kick off the earnings season, but they chose to move their earnings report towards the, the end of the earnings season. So then right now, uh, the, the earnings season will start with the big banks. We have J.P. Morgan Chase. We have Bank of America. We have Wells Fargo, Citibank, BlackRock. And then also we have Delta that will be kicking off the airliners that uh, will come in even um, on next week, the following week, the airliners will be reporting. But um, yeah, so then this week is sort of a light week. We don't have really much conviction, but um, but yeah, um, that's pretty much it. So um, what, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna return the mic back over to my brother, and then he's gonna continue uh, for the rest of the session, or we, or we may just end early and uh, just, prepare for the private war room. I don't know. Yeah, but um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't really have um, too much more for you now. Um, as you can see, price did react to this area of supply. It's still in this consolidation for the dollar. So then I don't have anything in regards to a dollar based um, currency pair or asset. But um, if you look at the year Aussie, it seems like it wants to break the highs. Um, we may not get that pullback that we've been looking for. Um, who knows what could happen, but, you know, we're waiting for price to get down to here, but we'll see, even if this is triggered, like, let's say price does come now, then I'll sort of be cautious of the buy because now we have this cluster right here. We'll have this cluster that will act as supply if we do get a deeper pullback into this zone. So then, you know, we'll see, but if price does break this week and these highs and make a higher high, then all we have to do is adjust our plan because once price makes a new high a new you know higher high and a higher close it makes a new high then when it does that it creates new demand so um all we have to do is look for buys around that new demand zone so then if price does push up and continue pushing higher it's okay uh, we'll just readjust and try to plan for a buy around a new demand the new demand zone that that will be created or formed but um all right guys yeah i don't have too much more to share yeah did you um did you guys have any questions are there any assets any currency pairs any commodities any anything that you want us to look at 
um, let us know. And then uh, we'll definitely uh, put an eye on it. I know today's meeting is pretty short. Um, you know, we really didn't have too many setups early on in the meeting. And um, it was just a short meeting because uh, right now with the way the markets are moving, there's very little uh, we could really look at at the moment. But yeah, for the most part, um, we're here for you guys. If you guys have any questions or concerns about anything, uh, we'll definitely be here to answer those concerns. But I guess that's it. Thank you guys so much for coming. Thanks, Joe, for coming. We really do appreciate you. Um, haven't spoken to you in a while. It'll be good to catch up. But um, that's it, guys. And like we say at the end of every single meeting, remember to always count your blessings, not your pips. And we'll talk to you later. Thanks, Naomi, for coming. Um, thanks, everyone else. And um, yeah, we'll see you guys soon or connect with you guys soon, maybe in a Discord group. Um, who knows? But yeah, I definitely want to meet for the private war room. Um, so we may do that today or we are going to do that today within like about an hour from now. But um, yeah, other than that, um, enjoy the rest of your day. And um, remember to always count your blessings, not your pips. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Hit and bye.